through some uh, franchise examples that would qualify for the E2 visa. So at this time, I'll, I'll turn it over to Angie to commence her part of the presentation. Thank you so much, Patrick. I really appreciate it. Um, it's great to be with all of you um, this afternoon, this evening, and this morning if you're on Pacific Coast time. Um, my name is Angie Rupert. I am the principal at Rupert Law Group here in Los Angeles. A um, little bit about us. We help people all over the United States and all over the world. We are focused on investors and employers, um, the immigration process for them to come to the United States. Um, a, the keys for us to a successful case are great client communication and simplicity. We try to keep things very easy for you. Um, not so easy for us, but you don't need to worry about that. We keep it simple on your end. Um, to that end, this presentation, I tried to lay out very, very clearly um, if there are any questions, as Patrick mentioned, please feel free to ask at the end. We are always happy to answer. Um, but let's get started with the E-2 visa. Um, there are many pros to the E-2 visa. It's actually probably one of the best ways to come to the United States. It is relatively quick. Um, it's only about 30 to 90 days. That depends a lot on the country where you're applying, that type of thing, but um, relatively quick. It's a much smaller investment than the EB-5, which you may have heard about. Um, those require a bare minimum of $500,000 and in some cases a million dollars investment. The E-2 visa does not require that much. We'll get into the investment amounts here shortly. Um, there are no minimum number of employees that you have to have which is great. They do expect you to hire employees, but they don't have a minimum number that you must hire. Um, and any industry and business is eligible. There are a couple of exceptions. Nonprofits are not eligible, and any business that is illegal is not eligible. That may sound kind of obvious. However, in some states, like California, there is a um, marijuana business that is legal, but on a federal level that is still not allowed, so marijuana business is not eligible through the E-2 visa. Um, another pro, spouses and children can come with the investor, children up to age 21, and uh, there is an indefinite stay. You have to reapply at the end of the visa term, which is usually two to five years, depending again on the country that you're from. Um, but some people can stay, they stay for 20 or 30 years as long as they're still running the business. Um, let's get to the next slide. So there are some drawbacks, of course. Um, only nationals of certain countries are eligible, as I'm sure most of you are probably aware. Um, there are about 30 to 35, I'm guessing, countries that are eligible. Um, children age out at 21. That is uh, one of... Uh, that's a pretty significant concern for those of you who have children that would be moving to the United States. Obviously, if you have children here, they are U.S. citizens, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, but there are, um, you do need to think of some options for your kids when they turn 21. Many of them switch status to an F1 status, which is a student status to continue college. Some of them get a master's degree, et cetera. But at the time that that status runs out, they're either going to, they're going to need to change status to something else or return to the home country. So something to keep in mind. Um, and you will need to apply, reapply every few years. So something else to, to really keep in mind that you'll need to keep that business running and it will need to be kind of on the trajectory that you originally planned um, in order to get those renewals. And... Sorry, I'm sorry, Carlos. Let's see. Okay. I just want to make sure that we are... Can everyone hear? I just want to make sure that everything's going okay. Better now? Okay, thanks, Andre. I appreciate that. Trying to stay as close to the mic as I can without looking weird. Okay, great. Thanks, Raquel. I appreciate it. Um, let me know. I'll continue to kind of look down at the chat. Uh, okay, is that a little bit better? Okay, 
Okay, great. There we go. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> All right, uh, technology, right? Okay, thanks, Carlos. Thanks, Pedro. I appreciate it, everyone. All right, let me know. I'll continue to look down. Um, let's see. Also, uh, there is some, uh, I guess, confusion over the long-term plans of the E2. It will never become a green card. You cannot change this into a green card. What people do is you can change to another status that may allow for a green card, but the E2 visa will never turn into or just kind of become a green card. You'll have to switch status to something else. That is possible. A lot of people do it, um, and there are a variety of ways to do that. But keep in mind that just the E2 itself will never become a green card. Sorry, Carlos. <laughs> OK. Can you hear? Just want to make sure. Um, let's see. All right, and also another con or another drawback to the E2 visa is that the change in ownership uh, can be an issue. Not 100% of the time, but if you sell the business, for instance, your E2 visa is no longer valid because you no, no longer are um, running the business that you were approved to run. So before you switch ownership, or even if you uh, have a new investor come in and that dilutes your ownership percentage, Okay, thanks, Andre. Uh, there could be uh, a, a problem. So just make sure to always speak with your attorney before you ever sell anything or change the ownership at all. So E2 visa requirements. You must be from a treaty country, as we discussed. There are a variety of them. And if you are unsure of if you are a citizen of a treaty country, uh, please let me know. I can always send out the link. There are too many to just list right now um, to, to see if you are eligible for an E2 visa. Um, and you must have either invested or uh, be in the process of investing a, quote, substantial amount. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, the enterprise must be real and operating, and the enterprise must not be marginal. That's the term that they use, is they don't want a business that is marginal. Um, finally, or actually almost finally, um, that you, you need to show that you can develop and direct the enterprise. And you must show, as we discussed before, it's not a green card, you must show that you intend to depart the United States after the visa ends. Usually that's not a problem at the interview, but sometimes it is something to consider. All right, so let's get down, uh, break down these requirements just a bit. Um, the nationality, you must be from a treaty country, and the U.S. does not recognize dual citizenship. Um, there are people out there, and there are many countries that do recognize dual, dual citizenship. The United States is not one of them. So if you are a dual citizen, for the purposes of an E2 visa, you need to be, uh, you need to present as citizen of whatever treaty country you are a member of. That means if you come over here on a B1, B2 to set up the business, to um, sign some contracts, to speak with some different vendors, etc., you need to come on the passport from the E2 visa country that you plan on uh, being a citizen of for purposes of application. So just keep that in mind. Um, if you are a Russian and a French citizen, do not come over on your Russian passport and try to do anything regarding this E2. Russia is not eligible for the E2 visa. France is. So something to keep in mind if you are a dual citizen. The investment. Now here is probably the most questions that I get speaking with clients and potential clients is about the investment itself. But it, it's a big deal. <laughs> to their credit, it is a big deal. Um, the investment portion is what is scrutinized the most by the counselor officers, so something to keep in mind. Um, the following aspects are what they're really going to be looking at. That you are in possession and control of the money, meaning you're the person that writes the checks, you're the person that has the control, it's your money. They want to see that. They want to see that risk is involved. 
basically they want to know that you have skin in the game. So they want to make sure that if this business fails for whatever reason, you're out the money. It makes them feel a little more secure that you're going to be working really hard to make this business work. Um, the capital must be irrevocably committed. So this is the part where it really takes a stomach. It takes some guts um, to do the E2 because that means in most cases, the money needs to already be gone. It's over. The checks have been written. They've been cashed before you ever get to your visa interview. So uh, the other option, and in the case of a franchise might be a very attractive option, is you may be able to put some of the money into escrow with the contingency being the approval of the E2 visa. That's great news for you. Um, two concerns that you may have. One, the seller has to obviously agree to that. Um, and then two, there are rumors in the last couple of months that many of the consular officers are not really happy with that option. It is technically available to you, but with Donald Trump's um, Hire American, Buy American plan, um, they're just being a lot stricter on what they accept and what they don't. So something to keep in mind. Um, and then, of course, the substantiality of the investment. Let's see, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. All right, so if you are investing or in the process of investing, it means that you are as close to the start of the actual business as possible. They want to see that everything is set up and all you're going to do is once you get this visa stuck in your passport, you're going to come to the U.S. and start working. They don't want a lot of, oh, well, once I get the visa, I will do this. I plan on doing that. I have money to do this. No. They want that ready. So when you get the visa, you come here, you start work. That's as close as possible to the start of business. That's what they're looking for. Um, they don't want to see contracts that can be broken, basically, like, Again, I will be doing this. I will be doing that. They want to see that you've already started doing it or you've already paid for whatever it is that you've signed the contract for. Keep that in mind. And they will not accept intent to invest. So kind of always keep that in mind. Anything that says, I will be doing this, that's not going to fly with them. They're not interested in what you will be doing. They're interested in what you've already done. All right, possession and control. Um, they want to not only know that it's your money, but they want to know how did you get it. So they source the money. Um, the great news is for you that it can be from any legitimate means. So no illegal activity. Don't talk about your drug trafficking days and how many millions you made there. We don't want that. But um, it can be a gift. Your parents could give you a gift. Um, Technically, and I get a lot of questions about this, technically anyone can give you a gift, but if it looks weird, like, you know, the bus driver that, uh, that drives the bus that you take every day and gives you $80,000, it's very suspect. So kind of keep that in mind. But I certainly, I actually just had a visa, an E2 approved on Friday, where the ex-wife of the investor gave him money, and she wrote a letter detailing why and how, and... Although they did say, he did, he, he told me that the consular office, officer did say, I have never had an ex-wife letter, but they accepted it and he got the visa. So you can get, um, you can get a gift from anyone. Just make sure it's legit. Um, the, uh, the, only, uh, the only caveat to the inheritance is the inheritance of a business is not going to work. Um, but you can inherit cash, um, gift, cash, that type of thing. Uh, some people ask about a loan. You can get loans, but keep in mind. Let's see. Okay, I'm sorry. Carlos. Mm. All right, I'm trying to speak as close to this mic as I can. Let me adjust it a little bit. Um, something else to keep in mind briefly is that Patrick and I will be uh, posting this um, presentation a little bit later. 
So if for some reason you missed something or you showed up a little bit late, um, you might be able to watch the video and Patrick will give you a little bit more information about that. Um, okay, so yes, you can get a loan. Okay, thanks Raquel. You can get a loan, but the mortgage debt or the commercial loan secured by the assets of the business won't work. They really want, if you have a loan, they really want it secured by your personal assets. So some people buy a house, some, or I'm sorry, sell a house. Some people get a second mortgage on a house, a line of credit, that type of thing. So those are options. Um, if you have an unsecured loan, uh, it needs to be based on the investor. So in fact, I had someone contact me last week who wanted to get a, an unsecured loan, and it's based on his, um, it was based on his kind of signature, a signature loan, but it was based on him, his credit, that type of thing. So that's really what they want to see as far as that goes. So substantiality, here's the big slide. This is one, the one that everybody always wants to know about. So the investment must be substantial, and that is the word they use. What does substantial mean? Nobody really knows. There's no hard line number. So you do not need to invest a certain amount. There is no $100,000 will do it, that type of thing. But keep in mind, $10,000 is not going to do it. $20,000 is not going to do it. They want a substantial amount. So one of the ways that they do that is they have a proportionality test. So it's on an inverted sliding scale, meaning the lower the cost of the business, the higher the percentage that's required. So if you have a business maybe that that is an $85,000 business, they're going to expect you to have already invested the $85,000. But if you have a business that's a $10 million business, you might be able to invest two or $3 million, even that's only 20 to 30%, but you would still have a substantial investment. So it really depends. It's a business by business uh, case, but the asking price of the business, so in the case of you know a franchise, they're going to say, hey, this franchise is $150,000. They will accept that as the value of the business. And you need to pay probably as close to $150,000 as you can when it's at that kind of price range. So, okay, let's see. I guess we talked mostly about that. So evidence. How do you show that you've already made the investment? They really want to see paper. They want to see evidence. So receipts, contracts that you've signed, canceled checks, credit card statements showing charges have already gone through. Um, you need to show that you've already spent the money, as we discussed. Now, here's another thing. If you have monthly expenses, so you have um, some sort of lease or rent, rental equipment, whatever, they will only count the prepayment toward the investment. So if your lease is $1,000 a month and you've only paid for one month before your interview, they're only going to take $1,000. They won't let you charge that or they won't let you count that $12,000, even though you've signed a contract for a year and you've already paid one month's lease. So if you are in doubt about the investment and that you may need to include more money to get to that substantial level, prepay your rent. Prepay anything that's rented or leased, and you can count that toward your investment. Um, obviously, anything that you have equipment or inventory, all of those things can be counted toward um, evidence of investment. Also, intangibles. Um, intellectual property, that type of thing, that works, and professional services, which is great. CPA, attorney's fees, um, so in that way, the attorney's fees are a really good thing for you, trust me. Just kidding. Um, all right, so to the second requirement, this business must be real and active. So you must show that the business will provide a, a service or a product. It's not just an investment. And, and in this way, that's where real estate sometimes runs into a problem. There are successful real estate companies that get E2 visas, but simply buying a house in the United States and renting it to one renter will not work. They need to show that you, first of all, you're going to have to hire employees and you're, gonna, you're going to have to show that um, those employees are going to be working, et cetera. Uh, and then you need to show that you're providing a service or a product. Um, and just having one house 
that's rented out will not work. So what is evidence of a real and active enterprise? Uh, business license, seller's permit, that type of thing, um, utility bills, phone bills, internet bills, really any kind of bills that are already coming to the business. Um, invoices from suppliers, if you have a lot of inventory and you've already ordered it, um, that would be great. Also, even um, pre-orders for your services. So if you're selling some sort of product and you already have some orders outstanding that you're waiting to fill until the E2 visa is approved, that's something else to consider. Um, and any kind of marketing or promotional literature, which in the case of franchise should be pretty easy to produce. You've already got, you know, whatever, business cards, flyers, you know, you've ordered signage for the actual stores, what have you, that's great. The business must be more than just marginal. And that is the term uh, used by uh, the government. They are looking to sure, ensure that you have a business that does more than just provide a minimal living for you and your family. In other words, they want you to hire people. Again, there are no minimum number of employees that you must have, but they are looking for this business to grow and for this business to really um, contribute to the US economy, not only through taxes, et cetera, but through hiring other employees and helping other families out because they're going to have a salary as, as a, a result of this business. Uh, they're really going to be looking for that employee hiring plan. They might even ask about that at the interview. That's a, that's a big question they ask a lot. How many people do you plan to hire? What would be those titles? What are the general salary ranges you're looking at? Those types of things. And when are you going to be hiring these people? six months after getting this visa, a year after getting this visa, et cetera. Um, in addition, they're going to want to look at your profit projection. And so that's another huge key for them, that you, each, each year it's going to be growing and that you have uh, all intentions of making this a profitable business. Mostly the evidence for this marginality requirement is through a business plan. So that's definitely one of the big requirements to include in your E2 packet is a business plan with projections, and et cetera. Direct and develop. So the E2 investor needs to own at least 50% of the business, uh, but 51% is better. Uh, it just is easier to show that you have control over this business if you have a majority stake. There are definitely more complicated ownership structures, for sure, and some that work just fine. But if you can keep it simpler, if you have the option of keeping it simpler, owning 51% and then the other 50% can be whatever is ideal. Uh, but you know, everyone is a case-by-case -case basis, so we can always talk about that individually about kind of your plans of, for ownership. Um, also, Technically, there are no uh, limits to the age of the investor, and there are no limits to kind of your prior work history. However, they do keep that in mind. If you are 22 years old and have never worked, and now you're going to start a brand new, you know, car manufacturing plant in Michigan, they may have some questions. Even if you have the money, that could be a concern. So. For someone who is middle-aged, who has worked for a couple of decades, even if it's not exactly within that area of expertise, generally you can come, come up with some type of experience you have that will be helpful to run this business. But the younger the investor, the more we really have to show, hey, this person's very serious. They're an exception to the rule. They're definitely going to be able to run this business, et cetera. So keep that in mind. So the procedure, we've gotten through the requirements now. What is the procedure? I try to keep it for you as simple as possible. So first things first, I send out a checklist and you gather the documents and send them to me. Uh, we prepare the E2 packet and submit them to the consulate or the embassy in your home country and then schedule an interview date. And usually, depending on the country and kind of depending on the time of year, sometimes it's busier, sometimes less, You'll get the interview within about four to 12 weeks of submitting the materials. Then you go to your interview at the consulate um, and you are usually either approved or denied at the window. 
Um, so you leave your passport and they uh, will print out your visa, stick it to the passport, and then you'll either come pick it up in about two to three business days or they'll mail it to you. Um, and then you're here. Welcome to the US. Um, a little bit more about the consular interview. The interview is incredibly important. There's just no um, downplaying how crucial the interview is for this process. It will last between 30 seconds, yes, really 30 seconds, if it's a slam dunk one way or the other, and you know, they, they already know they're approving you or they already know you're denying you, it can be as short as 30 seconds. It can be as long as 10 minutes, but the average interview time is two to three minutes. That is it. You present your entire case within two to three minutes. Um, the best thing that you can do as the person being interviewed is you will need to um, know everything that was submitted in your packet, which shouldn't be a big deal. Your attorney obviously would send it to you at the same time. So you need to know everything about your business plan and all of the other documents because the uh, officer can ask you questions about anything that, has, that is in that packet and anything beyond, actually, but usually they stick to the packet. Um, many times the officer has not reviewed any of the documents before you walk up to that window. So they are kind of multitasking. They're on the computer. They are looking at your documents and they're talking to you at the same time for about two to three minutes. And the officers have seen it all. They do on average about 100 visa interviews a day. Not all for E2s, but they see about 100 people a day. And they usually have uh, the job for about a year to two years. So they've seen tens of thousands of people and they can sniff out anything that seems odd in a second and that's usually what they ask the questions about they want to make sure that this is completely legitimate so the better you know the packet and the better you're able to answer questions the better your odds all right next and i see there are some questions um and i think that patrick and i are kind of keeping track and we'll answer kind of at the end uh some people want to go through the uscis with very few exceptions. I normally do not recommend this because um, you, the Department of State, meaning the consular office, does not have to abide by the decision of USCIS. And if you go through USCIS and you leave the country for any reason, no matter where you go, you have to go through the process again at the consulate. And they uh, do not have to abide by USCIS standards or decision. And I'll give you a real life, a quick real life example. I had someone contact me who had gone through USCIS a, about a year prior, and he was uh, had a, a family emergency in his home country, and he needed to leave. But his business was not doing well that first year, and he knew it was going to take him the next two years to get it back to a profitable state, and so he had a decision to make: did he leave the country? and risk not getting his E2 approved because he couldn't show that he was actually profitable because they're looking at it for the first time and they're saying, hey, this isn't a profitable country uh, company. He probably would have been denied or skip his family emergency and just stay in the United States. So that's something really to consider. Um, family and E2, as mentioned, spouses can come and work anywhere they want. Children can come and go to school. When they turn 21, they will need to change their status. And questions, although I think I'm going to hold those questions until Patrick is done. I know he has a lot to present here as well. Um, so this is my contact information. Please contact me anytime. I believe we'll probably be sending this out a little bit later as well um, to talk about the details of your case. Happy to go over it with you. Um, so with that, Patrick, take it away. Thanks, Angie. Really appreciate it. Um, pulling up my presentation right now. Can everyone see it all right? Perfect. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about our company, uh, the U.S. Franchise Market and Opportunities. I'll go through two business examples in detail, uh, two businesses that would qualify uh, for the E2 visa or some other investor visas, and walk through our advisory services and uh, process in uh, parallel with, with Angie and other uh, legal 
and, and, and other attorneys. Um, as a key part is also working with a, a franchise attorney and or a, a corporate attorney. Um, so I'll kick it off. Uh, all we do is help find and analyze businesses for foreign nationals, uh, principally franchises for VE2 visa. About 80%, 85% of our clients are seeking to obtain the E2 uh, visa. And based on your skill set, desired location, location, investment size, time allocation, uh, we're able to find uh, the best four or five uh, franchise opportunities for you and your family. A little bit about our firm. We're based in Miami, Florida, with offices across the United States, Latin America, and Turkey. We have a portfolio of 73 franchises, uh, which we feel comfortable enough in presenting it to clients. We've analyzed over 850 uh, franchises, and every day we have a few franchisors that reach out to us, both U.S. brands and foreign brands um, that have entered or already entered, uh, that, that are, or are entering or have entered and been established in the United States for many years. We've advised clients so far from 30 different countries. Uh, I personally speak Portuguese and Spanish. I have a, a Turkish business partner based in Istanbul. And we have local offices in Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina. Um, I'm mostly focused on one of two co-founders together with my brother, Jack. I am mostly focused on uh, the marketing and sales of our organization. And Jack is focused on the franchise search and analysis for our clients. Um, I have experience in the financial market, having started my career at JP Morgan out of New York City, and then worked at some other financial institutions, consulting, and uh, last worked at a, uh, a private equity fund focused on the EB-5 visa. But what happened? Uh, I was doing a lot of seminars, meeting a lot of prospective clients, and I found out through these prospective clients about the E-2 visa, and that you could invest less money you could move to the U.S. in a shorter time frame, and you could have total control of your investment and potentially make uh, more money. Um, I had about 50 prospective clients, and I didn't have anyone uh, reliable professional to refer them to. And at that point, my brother Jack, and now business partner, was working at uh, Burger King Corporate here in Miami, and we uh, started Visa Franchise a little over two years ago. Um, so we're a fairly new company, but we've uh, cemented ourselves in the leader as a leader uh, in the spaces of finding and analyzing franchises for foreign nationals, especially for the uh, E2 uh, investor visa. Um, you really have three options, and uh, Angie works with a variety of clients that are starting their own business or buying existing businesses. These are two options. Um, the appeal of an existing business is that the business is already operational. You have an inherent client base and historical financial question, uh, figures. Um, however, sometimes these financial figures can be fraudulent and you have to spend a lot of money with the accountant to do a, a forensic analysis on, um, on the business to see if, uh, if the the assets they have, if the liabilities they have are true, or, or are they tied to that individual, or they're tied to the company, uh, and check the numbers. Generally, it costs 1500 plus. Uh, many of our clients have looked for existing businesses for six months, spent money with accountants, and have become pretty disheartened with the entire process, then come over to uh, Visa Franchise to start from scratch. Uh, open a new independent business. Uh, we work with a lot of successful entrepreneurs that come from throughout the, the world. The U.S., in my opinion, is the most competitive market. Uh, very easy to enter and exit the market. Uh, low barriers of entry. Everyone wants to be here with a consumer base over 300 million uh, people and countless uh, multinationals that are based here. Uh, so you're dealing with an unfamiliar market and uh, at times starting a, a new independent business doesn't have such a high capital requirement that many of these uh, embassies are, are looking for. So I prefer in most cases that our clients do that on the side and don't have it directly tied to the, uh, the visa. Opening a new franchise business then is our preferred option. You have all the support from the franchise or it's established business model and you have economies of scale if you want to open up subsequent uh, units. There are costs associated with gaining the franchise rights. 
and restrictions imposed by the franchise war. Uh, but we feel that these uh, these costs are, um, are are credited back in the form of savings uh, for when you buy products and services through through vendors, as they pass on the savings uh, to you as a franchisee. Uh, in almost all of the cases that we work. So there are about 5,000 brands of distributor ships and franchises in the US. Uh, nearly 800,000 units, they contribute to 21 million jobs. Um, direct and indirectly, it's a uh, $2.3 uh, trillion impact on the US economy. And there's been growth above 26% since 2010. Here are some of the key industries that we focus on uh, that we feel are poised for growth and will sustain economic downturns in the coming years. Quick service restaurants, uh, so coffee, chicken, um, some, some beer concepts. We look for concepts that have high margins um, and, and in general high revenue. Uh, beauty, massage therapy, hair salons where there's renewable revenue and uh, generally high margins. Pet care, it's a booming industry in the United States. Uh, and then cleaning, commercial cleaning services, real estate, education, fitness, uh, generally those rely heavily on the owner and tend to be uh, a lesser investment amount, as you'll see on the next slide. So at the 100 to 250K level, most of the businesses are service-based, where you'll be working from an office location, and oftentimes field, and, and directing and managing uh, a team that's supporting the marketing and sales effort as well as the day-to-day the -day operations. So that could be schematic where it's a commercial cleaning and restoration services and there is equipment, you have the, the vehicle, but you don't have a big build out like you would have potentially for an ice cream franchise or uh, a franchise that, that sells chicken where you have to have all the, the equipment, the architect plans, uh, permits from the local city, the rent deposit, etc. It adds up very fast. So many of our prospective clients um, come with false expectations that with 200K, 300K, you can open up a Starbucks where, in effect, Starbucks is not a franchise in the United States. And if it was, it would be far, far more money uh, to open up a, uh, a retail outlet of that capacity. Um, so in terms of the, the different business options, uh, this shows a range. We have worked with some franchises that only have five units and they've been around for, say, five years, and uh, we've analyzed the numbers and, and the, vetted the executive team, and they're poised for growth and, and creating you know, their 10, 20, 30 units. And then we also work with uh, very established brands like Church's Chicken that has uh, about 1,600 uh, units and Johnny Rockets, many of you might be familiar with. Uh, the more money that you're willing to invest, the more opportunities that open up. If you have a very strong command of the English language, you could do an investment between 100 and 150K. Um, if your English isn't very good, we're generally only working with clients that are willing to invest above 180,000, 200,000, as you need to have enough, uh, enough margin for uh, a day-to-day -day, uh, manager. What we look for in the, the franchises that we add to our portfolio, there needs to be a solid business case, uh, recurring revenues. So um, use an example, a property management that I'll go through. Every month you can uh, expect to receive 6 to 10% of that rent and check. And it's not a very high margin business, but you can expect to receive that uh, residual over the next months and years. High margin business. Um, we work with many high margin concepts, but you know, if you're selling ice cream, if you're selling beer, they tend to have quite high uh, high margins. Uh, growing brand uh, or or in, and and or industry. Uh, so many of those industries I went through uh, are growing quite a lot. So on the pet care and beauty side, as well as some of the quick service uh, sub industries that that we uh, that we cover. And then strong management team, because in franchising, uh, you're in business for yourself, but not by yourself. So you have the franchisor that's providing support uh, along the process and uh, can help uh, with not just the initial startup and, and negotiations of the lease and training of your initial team, but on an ongoing basis. And uh, it really helps have a strong brand association and uh, 
having someone that's constantly negotiating on your behalf with the, the various vendors that you uh, source product and, and services from. And then territory availability. A lot of our clients want to move to Florida or, or, or California where Angie is based. And uh, a lot of Americans want to move there. I'm originally from Washington, D.C., lived in New York, and moved down to uh, Miami, Florida. And there are a lot of Americans that are also moving down to Florida, uh, and vice versa with, uh, with, with, with California. So a lot of times, the uh, territory is not available in these states. So it helps when the clients are a little more flexible in terms of where they're willing to invest uh, for their E2 visa business. And then that the franchise accepts foreign nationals. In fact, many of our clients uh, they're the first uh, foreign national to be accepted by the franchise. And we're constantly advocating on the behalf of our clients to accept uh, our, 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 uh, our, our franchisee, the, 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 the client that's engaged our services, working with Angie, educating the franchisor on the E2 visa program, and that it isn't as complicated as it seems, and that these foreign nationals can be a real asset compared to some of the other franchisees that enter the system, uh, potentially Americans that might have just entered because uh, they left the corporate world and they kind of don't really know what they want to do, where our clients are investing, they have a visa tied to it, so the business better go well, and uh, there's more of a long-term uh, commitment and, uh, and, and passion. Um, many brands like Subway, Dunkin' Donuts, Baskin Robbins, Jimmy John's do not accept foreign nationals. Uh, from our understandings and, and discussions with, uh, with the franchisors. Um, only about 70% of franchises are, are willing to work with uh, foreign nationals. The other ones require that you have a, a green card or U.S. passport. And many franchise brands, like I heard Burger King, you, you need to sign a, a, a multi-unit development agreement. So you can go through many of the, the big brands that you uh, might see commercials on. And in most of those cases, it's a million dollars per unit. And you have to sign a, a development agreement over the next five, 10 years to open up five, 10, 20 uh, different franchises. So for most of our clients, that is not a good fit. There have been a few exceptions for us. Um, our clients come from all over uh, the world, as mentioned. But we had a very heavy concentration in Latin America up until this year. Um, and again, most of our clients are investing uh, to obtain the E2 visa and a lesser extent the, the EB5 or L1 or purely just investing in a franchise. So I'll go through two business examples. Uh, the first being property management. That's been an increasingly popular uh, option for our clients, especially those that have an architecture, engineering, real estate background. Um, and essentially you're going to be uh, managing and acquiring units to manage uh, both on the commercial residential homeowner association side and some of the concepts we work with also do vacation rentals uh, the opportunity is huge many millennials and um, and other uh, americans are are no longer uh, buying homes they do not have credit since the financial crisis they don't they're dis they're unmotivated to, to buy a house and this has uh, benefited the the property management business and there are a lot of funds, pension funds, and wealthy individuals that own large uh, portfolios of property, whether that be in Florida, Arizona, Illinois, all over the United States, but they might live in another city and they need a local person to, to administer their properties. Um, so for this, you need to have advanced English. There's no way around it. Most of the service-based concepts we work with, you need to have advanced English. You need to be able to communicate with the franchisor, and at least one of the partners that is signing, should you have an American partner that's also going to sign the franchise agreement and have participation in the business, um, needs to speak English and at times need to, need to already have experience in the field. Um, every franchise uh, is regulated by the Federal Trade Commission and needs to produce a franchise disclosure document. This is a very important, dense document. Uh, and it includes a lot of different items to it. So item 18, for example, can go through the, the sales and profitability of the business if uh, the franchisor decides to disclose that. And then you have other items like item 7 uh, that go through what are the initial costs to get the uh, investment off the ground and generally give a, a range. Um, 
in terms of the range, the fees range from uh, for the franchise fee, 45K. For this example, you have insurance, the signage, training, technology fee. And then most franchisors will have working capital anywhere from two to six months that they also include uh, as part of this. And then for this example, you have royalty, 7%, uh, ad fund, 2%. And then uh, the key is working with your immigration attorney, especially if it's going to be an investment around the 100K range, 110K, as you want to make sure that it's substantial enough and as close to being operational and ready to, uh, to run. Uh, in terms of the licensing, it depends uh, largely on the state, but most of the time you already need to have the social security number to sit for the, uh, the, the, the real estate license exam. Most states, you need to have a sales associate license for, for property management. Um, and there are times that you can hire someone that already has that license so you can open up the, the business in a, in a shorter uh, time frame. These are drawn from the, the item 19, uh, which this particular franchise example discloses that they have 225 uh, franchisees reporting in their system and uh, the average annual revenue per units about uh, 2600 uh, and you have these franchises if you uh, if you if you multiply it that that will get uh, close to uh, 600,000 in gross sales uh, but it takes some time to get there uh, so that's why we just pick the uh, more than one year but less than three years franchisees because it takes some time uh, to get to that number and say the average units that you're managing is 91 years for franchisees between one year old and three years old. Um, so the first year can be tough like any other startup and uh, then after a while you're accumulating a portfolio of properties to manage and the referral business really starts to kick in. And um, a key part to our process and uh, keep this in mind uh, is talking to franchisees. We had a client invest in a property management franchise who spoke to 16 franchisees. He wanted to understand and get a better clarity on the, the profitability, how long it took to scale up the business, what they like, liked about the franchisor, what they didn't like about the franchisor, what were the hardest parts to, to getting started and then sustaining the business, what are some other potential revenue opportunities. They found out that most of the property managers also acted as real estate brokers, and we're buying and selling the, the homes, uh, some of which they, uh, they manage. Uh, so it's key and, and a fundamental part of the process to speak to the, uh, to the um, two other franchisees in parallel to, to your conversations with the, the franchisor. Doghouse, very innovative concept out of California. Uh, we were just with the founders uh, last month. Um, they're very well established uh, re uh, restaurant entrepreneurs that have created a fast casual concept beer hall that also serves hamburgers and, and hot dogs. Um, they've been, it's a fairly new company uh, since 2010, but they've already opened up close to 30 units and they have over 300 more units in development with FG group of companies, which is a strategic partner of uh, a visa franchise that had took, has taken on massive development territory for many, uh, many franchises, including uh, Doghouse. Um, so for this option, um, there is a potential for the client to run the day-to-day -day operations if, if, they, uh, if they qualify, as well as we have some clients that want to play a more strategic role in directing and developing the operation and don't necessarily want to be there every single day at the business or potentially want to invest in multiple businesses and have a, a mini portfolio. Um, so in terms of this opportunity, uh, the client would own a majority uh, of the franchise and there would be a local operator that would also have a, a small participation and be responsible for running the day-to-day -day, and the E2 uh, investor would be um, in constant contact with the operator um, on a lot of different aspects to the business and, and development. Um, and for this option, it's about a 400K uh, investment. And uh, we've, 
we've negotiated on behalf of our clients that if the client, if our client is rejected for the E2 visa, not once, but after the second time that they would receive the majority of their uh, capital back. So the brand, I don't know how, oh, let's see if we can zoom in here. Um, so sales uh, for many of the affiliate restaurants are, 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 are quite high. Um, it's in the million dollar range uh, for almost all, all of the units. And uh, for many of the ones that FG Group are developing, they're single standalone stand units, and uh, they should be on the, the high, high uh, end of the range. Again, a lot of this information and in, in color you can get from uh, speaking to the franchisees, the franchisor, and uh, operators and, and, and management team. So in terms of our process, on average of the three month process, invest in, in a franchise and receive your E2 visa. Uh, we've had clients that it's been a year and a half, uh, largely because they're looking to liquidate uh, their real estate uh, to, to invest in the, in the business. Uh, our relationship with the prospective client starts with a free franchise consultation. We need to better understand your needs and, and see if we can be of support and do a, a great job and really, for us, that means presenting four to five uh, top businesses that uh, any of them, you're, you're going to be well poised for success. If we feel that we could only present two, three businesses, we're probably not going to take on your case. Um, and then we present the businesses. I'll go over further detail what that entails. But you can see that we're working in, uh, in unison with, with Angie. And then most of the time, you need to have a, a franchise attorney to review the franchise disclosure document and uh, working with Angie uh, on all the immigration uh, part of this. So our services, you've already met Angie, uh, so speaking with immigration specialists, if you need a uh, tax specialist, happy to refer a tax attorney or, or an accountant and or an accountant. We do our personalized franchise and business search. Generally, you'll fill out a questionnaire. It is about 40 questions. Uh, it should take you about 20 to 30 minutes to fill out, to complete. Uh, based on that, we would have an onboarding call with our franchise search and uh, an analysis team where we have up to a month, but right now we're averaging two weeks to present the best four to five franchises for you. This is a 50-page report on average. It includes a business evaluation on key metrics that we look for the business, and then also part of those metrics are personalized to, to your uh, background. Uh, we do a pros and cons analysis, like anything in life, there's the goods and bad uh, of, any, of anything. Industry review, and then the summary of the most important uh, financial information from the franchise disclosure document. Again, many times this FDD can have over 200 pages. We've, redu we've reviewed hundreds of them, and we have a pretty good idea of, of how to uh, take out the most important information and, and put it in a way that you can consume uh, quite easily, but we encourage that you read through every word of this franchise disclosure document, especially in, uh, uh, especially together with your, uh, your legal counsel. And then you'll generally want to talk to at least a few of the franchisors. You start the, the process with them. Most of them require a discovery day where you need to meet the franchisor in person for a whole day, meet the executive team. And it's a two-way street. So we provide a lot of our clients with support on what questions to ask the franchisor or what questions to ask the franchisees. As um, they don't, especially some of the, um, especially some of the franchises we work with are very exclusive in who they allow into their system. So uh, Angie went into a lot of details with E2V, so we have some questions that will open up to the audience, but. This visa is increasing at a very high rate. It's 38% uh, over the past five years. Uh, nearly 44,000 uh, visas were issued in 2016. Uh, we've seen a, a, a lot of petitions in, in increase from Turkey and Brazil, where we have many clients. The adjusted approval rates around 92%. Uh, the first time an applicant goes in, and again, this is all from the Department of State and uh, is, is public statistics is around 79, 80%. We have had, unfortunately, a couple of cases where the client uh, at times didn't invest enough capital. The, the, the consulate said that there wasn't a substantial investment and they had to return uh, 
to the consulate, but they give you the reason behind why you weren't uh, approved. So you need to work with the attorney, potentially uh, invest more money, adjust the business plan, and then go back in um, where you, you should have a very high uh, chance of, uh, of, of getting approved the, the second uh, go around. Um, but you know, again, we don't want to. We want to minimize um, anyone having to go back in for for an interview. And the key part is really listen to your attorney and prepping for the interview. Uh, is, uh, it can be very short, uh, but they can ask some tricky questions. And especially if you don't know the business plan well, uh, they might they might deny you on a, a variety of of, of different different reasons. We're based in Miami, Florida. I'm calling here from our, our headquarters. Um, and I think at this point, we'll open it up to uh, two questions. Um, I think we'll start first with the ones more geared towards uh, Angie. Or I could start first. This, someone asked about the, the business plan cost. Um, it depends. We work with uh, one one provider in particular, but um, it depends on if it's just going to be for the E2. But we've seen anywhere, you know, around seventeen to to twenty five hundred. But uh, it depends on the, the business plan writer. Um, and then I can answer this question together with Angie. What happens with the money after you invested in a franchise and, and you didn't get approved for the visa? Generally, there's a pretty clear reason why you didn't get approved. Um, and uh, if it's a service-based franchise, sometimes it can be contingent on the E2 visa approval. But most of the times, you'll need to update the, the, the business plan and uh, invest potentially more money and, and resubmit the petition. Uh, worst case scenario, you can uh, always sell the business to another franchisee, uh, back to the franchisor, uh, or to a potential another E2 visa applicant. But we're doing everything in our power to minimize uh, the the chance of denial and um, I don't know and, Angie you want to provide any additional commentary uh, sure. thanks Patrick I would just say a couple of things about that first of all better now sorry about that um, the one thing that I would like to say about that is um, as Patrick said the odds are really good if you can show the requirements most of these get approved an overwhelming majority of get approved but if for some reason you are denied, um, you usually get an explanation of why you were denied, and you always have a chance to fix that. So it's not one of those situations where you're denied and then, well, that was it. You blew it. It's over. It's not that. Um, I'm not saying that it doesn't come with some consequences because they will always have record that you were denied a visa for you know whatever reason, but you do have an opportunity to fix that. And there are people that successfully apply the second time with uh, changed data information, and they are approved. So uh, I just kind of wanted to point that out. Um, one other thing I want to point out before I head back over to Patrick, something that he mentioned, and I saw kind of in the chat, is that there are some sellers out there, specific, uh, particularly if you're just buying like a one-off business from a mom and pop somewhere, that are, that are very hesitant about the E2 visa. But um, that's really the advantage of working with someone like Patrick and Patrick's firm, because they're able to talk to the, the um, sellers. And also, they know who is wanting to, to sell to for a national. National. So that's a huge advantage that Patrick doesn't, you know, want to brag about. A huge is uh, a crew provide. Um, so really consider that as well. Okay, Patrick, back to from your end. Um, Ali had a question in terms of uh, he, he's 24 years old, uh, potentially applying for the E2 visa uh, as a manager, as also as an Investor alongside his father, and you, you talked briefly about it, but it could be good to uh, to clarify that you know that he doesn't have all that. Yeah, there, and, and like I mentioned, there is no um, there is no age requirement 
that that is not there. Um, but they will be looking just for experience and that type of thing. If your dad is going to be your partner and your dad has a lot of variance, that's something else to consider. Um, that you know that you can always point that out in that the, um, application or the the packet is, hey, we do have someone who's very experienced, has 30 years of experience, and I have a degree in X, and I have several years working, you know, customer service or what have you, um, play up your role, and then really do how, you know, dad can help. There's always a little bit of catch there, because you're supposed to be able to direct and develop the business as the investor. So something you want to keep in mind that you don't just put it all off on dad, because they want to see that you have the ability to do that as well. Um, as far as being the essential employee, your dad were to be the investor and you were going to be the essential employee, that is a possibility, but of late, that has been getting more difficult. They want to see you hiring Americans. So if you are going to apply as the essential employee, you need to be essential. And you need to point that out very, very clearly. Uh, why I see you a person and not already bit, but person. can you maybe talk about the, uh, the, the differences of submitting at the USCIS versus the, the different uh, consular post? Sure. Um, yeah, almost always. I'm trying to think of a time that I've recommended uh, applying. I I, I, you know, I'm sure there's, there's, there's some reason that you may want to apply at UC, USCIS plan. You have a funeral, you have a wedding, you've got to go right now. The second you leave the country, you're going to have to reapply. Yes, you do need a visa. So if you country, even if you go to not your home, any country, leave for a, a minute. You're going to have to reapply. And if for some reason your business is not on the trajectory that you thought, or if you have kind of a weak case that we kind of squeak through USCIS, the concept of the country, you own a company here that's still presumably running day to day, and you will not be able to come back into the country. So. If you go through the consulate, you get that visa, and um, but usually you have multiple entries and be able to leave the country, come and go more as you please. So something to keep it. Okay. Perhaps there were uh, Go ahead. I have questions here. Um, do we have gas stations available? Uh, no. We of our clients it doesn't make sense most of our clients don't want to be uh, at the the physical location and or at least five years of stations are not efficient to have an owner operator of course there are exceptions um, and then there are a lot of things that that we're wary of um, industries that can be greatly affected by uh, technology um, so retail, um, for all of you that spend time in California, you, you see now electric cars all over the place. So everything that we do is more mid to long, long term, and uh, we don't we're not we're not excited about uh, gas stations, and we do not work with them. In terms of franchises in the northern United States, uh, yes, we have clients moving to uh, Illinois area, New York area. Um, that have invested in franchises, so we uh, we work across the United States. In the next two weeks, I'm headed out to Vegas as well as New York City. So we're constantly traveling, uh, vetting out franchise orders, meeting with clients, uh, and we're not limited just to, to the southern U.S. as you can see on our, our map of office locations as well. Um, there was a question about factoring and uh, B2B businesses. So. In most cases, I think factoring in terms of short-term loans, if I'm not mistaken, you don't have a. It's it could be marginal, and Angie can comment further. But uh, and we do not work with franchises in that space. There are some uh, financial uh, 
businesses that we do work with uh, uh, that um, would qualify and have sufficient job numbers, but uh, for what I've seen with factoring, you have very minimal amount of jobs, and it's really just benefiting uh, the uh, the 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 um, the investor and their immediate family. I don't know if you want to provide an additional commentary, Angie. Okay, um, you know, as, as mentioned uh, before, you know, and I think that Patrick touched on this as well, really any business that is legal is eligible, but you have to meet the requirements and you have to show that you're going to be hiring people and that, um, you know, it's a real and operating business, uh, that it's not just an investment, it's going to actually take work, you're providing services, you're providing uh, products you know, whatever the business. So I would really focus on that, not so much what the business is, because anything could work, but you have to fill those other requirements. So if you feel like, hey, I can make $60,000 a year just me running this business, that's not going to be a two business. This needs to be, hey, I can make a living, and I can also hire three more people in the next year, and then maybe three more people in the next five years after that, full time. Now we're talking an E2 business. So it's not really about what the business is, it's the growth and the projection of the business. So keep that in mind. And then one thing I want to touch on, Patrick, before I hand it back. Um, you're here on a B2 visa, Javed. Um, that's fine. You can come to the United States on a B1, B2, sign contracts, find facilities, that type of thing. You cannot work on a B1, B2. But you can set up a business, return to your home country, do your interview, get your E2, and come back. So yes, you're okay on a B1, B2 to sign contracts, you know, maybe find vendors, have some meetings, that type of thing. You are okay to do that. Sorry, the line was still uh, muted. In terms of the beauty business uh, question, uh, Angie can provide comment on that, but uh, I don't see an issue. Um, that I think you just have to structure it well from uh, the, the immigration standpoint. Um, but generally, our clients would just have the investment first in uh, the wife's name if, in fact, she's going to be the one that's owning the business and, and directing the business uh, down the line. Um, OK, quick one for Ruby. Yes, eventually you could switch an E2 to an EB5. It's going to depend on your investment. And um, it's going to depend on the amount of employees. EB5 does have a minimum amount of employees. And um, so, you know, that's something that we could discuss, about, you know, where you want to have it, the minimum investment for that location, that kind of thing, and the, the, the process. But yes, you could do that. Um, oh, and Liz, hold on one second. Let me read. Okay, so it's not really a new 90-day rule. Um, it used to be kind of 30, 60, 90. Um, but I would say this. So you can come to set up a business because that is a B1 is actually um, coming here for work purposes, not to work, but for, I should say, business purposes. So you're here. That's fine. You would need to leave the country anyway because you would do your interview at the consular. Uh, I'm sorry, at the consulate. So you should be okay there. I think I'm, I'm understanding your question correctly because that is a valid reason is to be here for business. Um, so that's a valid reason. Um, so yes, you should be okay there. If you have further questions, obviously, and I, I know I speak for Patrick. Here too. Yeah, and I think some of these are now getting a little uh, a little personal, like because. Angie's going to need to see, you know, did you enter in, and when you entered in, did you say you were going for tourism or business? So I think some of these might be best addressed uh, over a one-on-one -on -one, uh, phone call. Uh, let's just wrap it up. Uh, we're, we're now over time. Uh, Suresh, no, you cannot invest in a subway for any two visa. I, I mentioned uh, they're one of the about 30% of franchises do, that do not uh, work with foreign nationals. So unfortunately, subway would not be an option. Um, and Ruby, yeah, the I think you on e, is at E2. I think there are ways, um, not directly, but that you can acquire a green card. And Angie needs to talk to you one on one to evaluate the the different options. 
And then Javid, we can talk uh, we can talk offline about how we work with our clients and, and type of uh, support we provide. Angie, is there anything else from your end until we uh, until we terminate the uh, until we end the uh, the webinar? I don't think so. Thank you, everyone. Um, this has been great. And please reach out to Patrick or I individually, what have you. I believe, Patrick, we're going to send out some sort of email or something with our contact info. Happy to talk with each and every one of you about your specific case. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, everyone. Take care.